Okay, hello. Um, for those of you that know me, you know I am not overly technical savvy. Uh, I am doing this for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to create a series of videos that I can then assign to supervisees that are counselors uh, to learn from as a part of my being a licensed professional counselor supervisor in the state of Texas. For those that are not under my supervision, um, these may or may not be beneficial for you, I don't know. Uh, take it as you will, okay? So, in any case, having said that kind of a disclaimer, some of this will be straight from me as an individual counselor and a supervisor. Some of this will be straight from my education. Some of it from experience. Uh, so, having said that, as a secondary disclaimer, hello, my name is Robert. Uh, I'm a licensed professional counselor supervisor here in the state of Texas. I work in the Montgomery County and Harris County area. Uh, my uh, company name is R-E-S-T, Rest Counseling Services. Uh, I have been in private practice now approximately one year. Prior to that, my background as a counselor was in crisis intervention. Uh, I've done hospital work, I've done outpatient work, uh, I've done nonprofit work, uh, chemical dependency recovery work. Uh, pretty much the only area that I have not got experience in is on little ones under the age of, say, seven, and on eating disorders. Uh, and some of the other specialty areas of counseling, uh, equine therapy, things like that. I just don't have the experience in that to be able to advise or uh, supervise in. Um, even in my own private practice, in cases of an eating disorder, I refer out. Um, my area of specialty is in trauma, and uh, I use various approaches. So, okay. Um, I have a Master's of Education in Counselor Education from University of Houston. I am also a doctoral candidate, finishing up my dissertation through Liberty University. God willing, that will happen uh, sometime this coming year in 2022. Uh, it has been a long journey. So, uh, some of the other areas that I have the experience uh, that I want to share on this video, uh, just about myself, to give the viewer an idea. I have 16 years as an LPC, five years as a state supervisor, uh, seven years total in crisis intervention and outreach, 10 years uh, as a Texas EMT paramedic in the 1990s. That background in emergency medicine has been very beneficial uh, working in healthcare. I would encourage anyone, if you want to work in healthcare, to take some extra classes get some background knowledge, EMT basic, um, anything, okay? Uh, basic EMT might be the easiest one to obtain because the rest of them, they kind of go into their own licensing for long-term career path, but it's very beneficial. Uh, prior to all of my work uh, in healthcare, I did five years as a psych tech while I was working my way through school. Uh, I also have three years in Christian ministry as a uh, pastoral counselor and pastoral ministries, uh, but that's been some time ago. Uh, like I said earlier, I do want to give insight into counseling. Um, I do not uh, and will not be teaching a whole lot on cognitive behavioral. There are so many people that do that already. Uh, look around YouTube. It's full of CBT oriented, EMDR oriented, dialectical behavior oriented, you name it, it's already out there. So uh, to begin with, I'm going to be covering basically in this first sequence of videos how to do your initial assessment, uh, the importance of it, the background history of it, and all together this should take somewhere between six to ten videos as I go through this. Each one will be focusing on another component of assessments. Uh, the first one would be, of course, the intake assessment uh, and looking at the differences thereof. 
going to be going into a detailed uh, breakdown of the biopsychosocial, uh, how to perform it, what the background history of it is, first of all, uh, and then also how to do a write-up of your narrative, how to actually explain it and put it into the uh, chart record uh, in such a way that people will look at it and say, wow, you got the information, you got all your criteria met, you obviously have an idea of what's going on with this client. Very important aspect. That then in turn leads us into the case conceptualization on how you will take all of that information from your intake assessment and translate that into a working plan on treatment, goals, uh, what you want to do and how you're going to go about accomplishing it. Later on, in another sequence of a video series, I'll be looking at theoretical orientation and how you as my supervisee uh, will be functioning and how you can develop your identity as a therapist. So for now, I think the most important part is uh, to recognize that there's going to be more videos coming. Hopefully this works out uh, for everyone involved. Uh, so, to really begin with, uh, for an introduction to counseling assessments, I think it's a real important to recognize that a lot of the schools do not really push, and when I say schools, I'm talking about not just the colleges, but the schools and theories of counseling and psychology. Many of them don't push assessments at all. Uh, in fact, when I went through for my master's, uh, several of the professors really were against doing assessments. Uh, there was, of course, one or two that were, yes, we have to do it. Here's why. Uh, in any situation, your assessment is going to function in two formats. One, uh, it will be following a medical model in the beginning, which is required. If you want to get reimbursement uh, in private practice uh, from insurances, guess what? You got to have it. If you're going to be working at a hospital setting, uh, they get reimbursement from insurances. Guess what? They're going to expect it. You're going to have to do an assessment. Now, a secondary perspective of assessments is that every session you do with a client is another assessment. Okay. We have to keep into account that an assessment is just a snapshot of that moment in time where they're at. Are they in crisis? Are they not in crisis? What's happening to them? What's going on in their world? Which is why I begin every session with a check-in. What's going on? Anything change between the last session and this session? Uh, that's in a private practice setting. In a hospital setting, you're going to find you walk in, they don't know you and you don't know them. You have to do an assessment right off the bat just to find out what's going on. Uh, we're going to talk also more about the medical model in, in a later uh, uh, video, but for now we just have to recognize that that's the model that the hospitals go with and that's the one the insurances want to use. Uh, also, I think it's real important to recognize that assessments do not have to be rigid and structured always. Now, psychiatrists, they do use a rigid, structured psychiatric evaluation format that they are all taught. Um, but even then, they can ease it up a little bit once they have experience and the practice of how to do that. Uh, and like I said before, the evaluation or assessment you do is only good at that point in time, for that little bit of time because you come back to them a few days later, new information is going to be there, memories will come back, emotions will have changed, they'll be different, and so would the assessment be. Uh, another aspect I think it's real important about recognizing uh, a key ingredient to your assessment is that it really is just a flow chart, okay? And, and I want you to use that concept of a flow chart of decision making as you're going through your assessment and you're getting information, you're talking to your client, what you're doing is you're gathering the data necessary for criteria to use to either rule in or rule out of any of the DSM criteria. 
Okay, so if you give them a diagnosis on your end of your assessment of what you think it is, your evaluation is this, and you're like, okay, it looks like it could be this, you of course cannot make the final decision, only a psychiatrist can, but knowing that you do have the ability to make an evaluation, say, okay, this is what I think it is, you better have your criteria lined up. Uh, and the purpose of the assessment and the biopsychosocial is to help you find that criteria. But there again, it's just a flow chart of decision making. What are you going to do once you get finished? How are you going to help these folks? Uh, big bold print item, never pigeonhole a client with a label based on one assessment. In other words, if you come to the conclusion at the end of a single assessment that you have a clear case of a personality disorder, you don't. Pure and simple, you don't. Because it takes a whole lot of uh, sessions with a client to be able to come to that conclusion. You may suspect there's some traits there or there's some, some qualities to them that may be personality oriented, but you don't have enough off of any one given assessment to give a label of any kind, okay? All right, uh, however, having said that, if you're working in a hospital environment, um, which many of my supervisees are, then you're gonna be working around psychiatrists and nurses, and once you have a, enough of a picture from all these different areas, uh, you got your psychiatry, you got your nursing, You've got your social work, which is where we would fall in. We put all those together, we can develop a much better picture of what the client's going through. However, in a private practice setting, uh, a diagnostic label can sometimes be a burden because the client can really take it and run with it. So you wanna be real cautious on what labels we use. All right, uh, also, I think it's real important for new counseling uh, people. Recognize that the doctor at the hospital is going to have a lot more information than you can probably ever get, simply because people are trained. Ever since the 1940s, they have been trained to tell the doctor everything. Give it to them uh, the full story. So because of that, uh, that white lab jacket pays off. People will tell them a whole lot more than they will tell us. Something you have to get used to. All right, so I think for this uh, session, I'm gonna wrap it up because we're pointing at about 13 minutes. My intention is to keep each of these at 15 minutes or less. So uh, the next one we'll be looking at the minty, eh, not minty, it might be, but the mini mental status exam. Until then, Keep doing what you're doing, unless you're doing something illegal, then don't do it.